Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum of 2022. My name is Tim Bruno, and I serve as the Chief of the Office of the Great Lakes for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. For those of you who are new to the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum, it helps to host environmental and informational sessions that allow participants to gain a deeper knowledge and appreciation of some of the issues that affect our Great Lakes. We do this not only with special attention to those issues that affect our water quality and water quantity, but also how they impact our lives and our communities. We strive to bring you some of the leading experts within the Great Lakes Basin and outside of it so that you can take the knowledge that you gain here, such as today's topics of invasive species and water use, and you can share those um, and everything you've learned with your family, your friends, your neighbors, and your colleagues. It's also an opportunity to bring forth issues to begin community conversations on those topics that are most important to everyone who lives, works, and recreates in the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Basin. There is time scheduled at the end of today's meeting that is devoted to bring forth those ideas and also please keep your thoughts ready to ask during the question and answer periods after each presentation. So today I expect you're going to hear um, some of the following themes from our presenters. We're gonna learn from one of the most foremost scientists in the United States on invasive carp and their actual and potential effects on the Great Lakes system. We'll hear from an Illinois water expert about the $868 million Brandon Road Interbasin Project. We'll hear from the coordinator of Pennsylvania's Governor's Invasive Species Council about the current statewide priorities of the organization and new initiatives. Finally, we'll also learn about the current water use statistics and trends within the Great Lakes and Pennsylvania from an executive staff member at the Great Lakes Commission who helps guide and uh, share data between the states and the provinces on a regional basis. And so now I wanna thank Amber Stillwell and extend my appreciation for the work that you've done over the last two months to bring quality information sessions here today and top-notch speakers. And so Amber, I'll turn it over to you to first speak um, about an opportunity for our attendees to learn about the Master Watershed Steward Program that you're coordin coordinating in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And then um, you'll be able to describe also some of the features of our online meeting today and how everybody can interact with presenters. So over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you all for joining us today. I am very excited to be here. And as Tim said, I'm the Coastal Outreach Specialist with Pennsylvania Sea Grant in the Lake Erie office. But my position is jointly shared with Penn State Extension, where I am the Master Watershed Steward Coordinator for Erie, Crawford, and Warren counties. So for all of you tuning in today, if you live in one of those counties, I have a great opportunity that's upcoming. We are currently recruiting trainees for the spring training class that begins on March 10th for the Master Watershed Steward Program. During this training, you will learn so, so much about watersheds and the differences that you can make to benefit and create healthier streams, rivers, and lakes. Not only will you learn a ton of information, you'll also get regular opportunities to work in your favorite watersheds and provide these resources to the communities that you love. You will also become part of a statewide volunteer network filled with passionate people and dedicated watershed professionals. I hope that you consider joining our team for the Master Watershed Steward Program through Penn State Extension because it is a ton of fun and we make a very big difference both locally and statewide. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Tim for a few Great Lakes updates. So for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, I'll give you a quick word about the DEP Office of the Great Lakes. And so in normal times, uh, we are located out of the Tom Ridge Environmental Center at the head of uh, Presque Isle State Park in Erie, Pennsylvania. But um, you know, we've been working mostly remotely uh, for almost the last two years now. But our office has a focus on Great Lakes water quality and quantity and linking the community to that resource. We coordinate with the US and Canadian federal agencies and governments and the other states and provinces to address water use and water quality challenges. 
We work within Great Lakes governance structures, both federal organizations, as well as interstate compacts to assure Pennsylvania is well represented and has a strong voice. We place emphasis on forming local community partnerships to encourage municipal and county cooperation and protect the environment. And this helps develop stronger communities for both today and tomorrow. Likewise, we develop water and land protection programs and help bring in and prioritize funding in Pennsylvania for projects that uh, really will benefit those who live here and work here and recreate here. So, uh, you know, moving on, as you'll hear in a few minutes, the threat of invasive carp entering the Great Lakes is very real and their effects on the food web, on the fishery, uh, on the recreation and boating sectors of our economy would forever change the landscape of what we currently know. Pennsylvania DEP and the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, as well as Governor Wolf's office, have been dedicated to assuring that invasive carp deterrents at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois, are constructed as soon as possible and funded in a way that reflects the national significance of the project. A couple of quick updates on Pennsylvania activities um, will augment what you're going to hear from others here today as, as uh, you hear the presentations. Um, most importantly, Pennsylvania since 2019 has been involved in high level negotiations between the Great Lakes states and provinces. And these have been convened by the Great Lakes Commission, Illinois and Michigan to move the Brandon Road project forward in a way that respects each jurisdiction's concerns and interests, and also reflects um, fiscal equity between the partners. These negotiations led to um, a letter that was issued in December 2021, signed by Governor Wolf, as well as the seven other Great Lakes governors. And it was sent to the US Senate Environmental Public Environment and Public Works Committee, as well as the U.S. House of Representatives um, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And that letter, it supports 100% full federal funding authorization for the Brandon Road Interbasin Project. And that a specific provision be included um, in the upcoming Federal Water Resources Development Act of 2022, as it's created. It's commonly referred to as WERDA. So the states recently got good news. Um, we learned that the Ar U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will dedicate over $225 million of that agency's allotment uh, from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to the Brandon Road Interbasin Project to complete the design and engineering of the, Asian, or the invasive carp deterrents and allow for the, the funding of the first construction phase. And so we as states will continue to advocate for, um, for this authorization of, of funding, as well as full appropriation of those monies while US Congress uh, creates the bill um, throughout the remainder of this year. Some words on, um, on water use uh, on the Great Lakes. The, uh, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact and Agreement is um, the U.S. Uh, interstate compact and international agreement that governs um, water use, water diversions, um, and uh, conservation and efficiency measures on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. So um, the two entities that, that are convened that, that do that governance are the Compact Council and Regional Body. And these entities met on December 9th where the jurisdictions presented updates as to water use activities within their boundaries. They adopted uh, upcoming budgets and they elected a new chair and vice chair. And I'm happy to report that Pennsylvania was elected as chair for 2022. And I'm honored to preside on behalf of Pennsylvania and Governor Wolf um, within these venues over the coming year. The next meetings of the Compact Council and Regional Body are tentatively scheduled for Thursday, uh, June 16th, to be held in person, hopefully, in Erie, Pennsylvania. And these meetings are always open to the public. And for more, and for more, more information or to join in the meeting, 
will then uh, info will be posted on uh, both the Compact Council website as well as the regional body website. I will drop the links into um, into the chat here very shortly after my presentation. An update as to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which is the binational agreement between US and Canada on water quality issues, um, as well as a host of other issues that influence water quality and habitat and biology in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes Executive Committee, which is the oversight body for the agreement, met virtually on December 1st and 2nd of 2021. Members received uh, updates from all of the annex subcommittees and learned of progress on numerous topics such as nutrients, lake-wide management, chemicals of mutual concern, and more. For more detailed information, uh, including minutes, as well as presentations that were, were made there, look for updates on the, uh, the agreement uh, website called www.binational.net. Um, I'll, I'll drop that in, in the chat also. One bit of good news is that in late November of last year, the Lake Erie uh, Lakewide Action and Management Plan was finally finalized and adopted for Lake Erie. And this plan covers management activities in Lake Erie um, from 2019 to 2023. So we're actually quickly coming up uh, on uh, an opportunity to, to relook at that, that document as well as make updates to it. But it, it's um, there is a, a, a lot of good information inside that document, and um, it can be found on binational.net um, at the address that I'll also include in the, the chat. Moving on to, uh, to funding on the Great Lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is a federally appropriated um, uh, funding source, it's currently appropriated at $330 million for the current fiscal year. And it's authorized to raise um, $25 million per year until it reaches 475 million in 2026. Now, additionally, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that's uh, has been referred to in many venues as the infrastructure bill or the infrastructure law that was signed by President Biden in November 2020, or 2021, included $1 billion for GLRI investments in the Great Lakes. And so that works out to $200 million per year over the next five years. And this is in addition to the annual GLRI appropriation that is anticipated, well, hopefully to be $400 million this year. So what this all adds up to be is that there is generational investments inside the Great Lakes right now, both with infrastructure, as well as trying to return some of these areas of concern that are polluted hotspots around the Great Lakes um, back to functioning pieces of our, our, our resource. And, um, you know, as I stated during the last forum, um, you know, these investments in infrastructure are gonna require capacity, not only in the federal government, but inside the states, inside counties and inside local municipalities so that we can properly engage ourselves in these funding opportunities. Some of them may be non-competitive, some, many of them will be competitive. And so, uh, you know, you'll compete against some of, uh, some of our neighbors to assure that the funding is dedicated to um, those things that really make a difference in our communities we'll have to be able to apply for and receive these funds. We'll have to be able to administer and put those funds into on the ground projects. And so um, all of our governments at this point need to be planning now for these opportunities. And I, I know that the Office of the Great Lakes is more, learning more about them um, literally daily. And um, we hope to be a part of that process in um, instituting good projects and, and bringing funds into Pennsylvania. I'm so excited to introduce Dwayne Chapman. He is a scientist emeritus with the United States Geological Survey. Dwayne Chapman is recently retired from the US Fish, US, sorry, USGS Fisheries. Um, he was a biologist with the USGS in the Fisheries Department for more than 40 years. 
He has published his first article on grass carp in 1987, and his work has focused largely on grass, black, silver, and big head carp for the last 20 years. Mr. Chapman has more than 75 peer-reviewed publications on invasive carps, including the 2013 article that first offered evidence of reproduction and recruitment of grass carp in the Lake Erie Basin. So Dwayne, thank you so much for joining us today. And we are so excited to hear everything you have to tell us about invasive carp in Lake Erie. Uh, silver and big headed carps are, are filter feeders. Like I said, the gills and gill archers and rakers that, that, are in the, um, that are in the center of the screen now are only part of the really remarkable and highly specialized filtration system that these fish have. Um, big head carp, which tend to filter a, a larger particle size of silver carp is on the left, and uh, the silver carp gill rakers are actually fused into this sponge-like mass with microscopic pores so that they can feed on phytoplankton as small as nanoplankton size range. The silver carp image on the right, by the way, is the only silver carp ever captured on the wrong side of the electric barriers near Chicago, and the big head carp on the left is my son, taken about 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, the primary effect of moderate or large populations of big-headed carp is a massive reduction in the abundance of crustacean zooplankton, usually commensurate with an increase in the abundance of phytoplankton in the picoplankton and smaller nanoplankton size ranges, which aren't fed on efficiently by the big-headed carps. Big-headed carps will eat and under some conditions can be a control for hazardous algal blooms, but they have trouble with microcystis, which causes most of the habs in Lake Erie, and they sometimes make the matter much worse. Uh, so, and then smaller zooplankton, such as rotifers, can increase, increase or decline, depending, I believe, mostly on the primary productivity level of the invaded system. And the changes, the, this dramatic changes at the bottom of the food chain can obviously cause ripples throughout the food chain, and we've experienced those in places where the carp are highly abundant in the United States. Next slide. So the, the big-headed carp invasion has been shown to damage the growth of native fish to plankton as an adult, as you might imagine. But when big-headed carps have been introduced elsewhere in the world, they've affected recruitment of fish that have larvae that live in open water. We don't know if this is because the carp eat the larvae, but mathematical models seem to indicate that seem to indicate that eating larvae would be necessary for this to happen in the Great Lakes Basin. In Lake Erie, that means walleye and yellow perch, which are kind of important in, in that part of the world. Uh, crappie also are open water planktivores after they leave the nest. And there's some data from floodplain lakes that seem to indicate that crappie are also uh, substantially affected. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, there's this. If, um, if you, anybody water skis, you can see why you really don't want to do that in the presence of uh, silver carp, but they also hurt people uh, just jumping into the boat, uh, even when you're not water skiing. Uh, silver carp are the jumpers that have become so famous on YouTube, and they're by far the most abundant of the four carp in the Mississippi River Basin. Next slide. So, and then moving on to grass carp, uh, the, these are the vegetation eating um, grass carp. They have these pharyngeal teeth. If you look how similar they are to look, lots of little horse teeth. And for the obvious reason that grass carp and horses could sort of eat the same kinds of things to make a living. Uh, the fish in the picture was about four feet long, extremely fat and caught from water connected to Lake Michigan. So if you think that there's not enough food in the Great Lakes to to grow grass carp, uh, think again. So grass carp are, again, nearly unique among freshwater fishes in their ability to eat huge amounts of aquatic veg. This is why they're brought to North America and why they're still used as an effective and low-cost removal of aquatic vegetation, some of which is itself invasive. They are inefficient at digesting that vegetation, but highly efficient at eating large amounts of it quickly if it's the kind they like. So aquatic vegetation is an important part of the ecosystem. So when you take it out, it not only alters the food chain, but it has a lot of other physical effects on the environment, you know, such as spawning and nursery habitat for native fishes. And it can increase wave-induced wave erosion. Um, and 
just the way the nutrients are cycled. And also, um, I, I understand that wild rice is, is fairly important in the Great Lakes uh, region among certain peoples, and they like it. Um, so again, before we get into the, the what we're going to do about the fish, I, it's important to know that everyone understand this life cycle of these invasive fishes. The, the adults migrate upstream, uh, usually in large and turbulent rivers and turbid rivers, it's to these to especially turbulent areas like the ones at the top of the screen where you have islands and, and, and tributaries coming in and where they engage in mass spawning events. They usually takes a lot of fish to get off the spawn. It's not one, it's not just one male and one female or a male with a nest waiting for a female to come. It takes a lot of fish. The eggs then drift downstream and eventually hatch in the drift, and the larvae continue to drift downstream until they reach about the gas bladder inflation stage. And at that time, they need to quickly migrate laterally from the river to low velocity nursery areas where they can get food. If there's too much turbulence, it can be lethal to the eggs. And if there's not enough turbulence, the legs sink to the bottom and become covered with sediment, which kills most of them. And the larvae in between uh, hatching and gas bladder inflation have little to no predator avoidance skills. So if they don't stay in a turbid river where site feeding predators can't eat them, then life is really cheap. We used to think that survival of eggs and larvae required a river that was at least 100 kilometers long, but the flu egg model that developed in a USGS led project showed that much shorter distances could result in survival of some of the eggs and larvae. And then Ted Heer's more recent work showed that some eggs can be trapped in eddies and survive in really, really short river sections. But it's important to remember that these shorter distances are not good for the mass survival of the, ma of the vast majority of carp eggs, and they're likely to result in the survival of only a tiny fraction of the spawned eggs, which then have to go through all the normal, very high natural mortality that all larval fish have to endure. So life is already cheap if you're a larval invasive carp. And then the small, short, in some cases, low turbidity rivers of the Great Lakes Basin further cheapen that very cheap life. Next slide. Okay, this is from a 2017 document, but big-headed carp status in these basins has been changing really slowly in recent years. Um, and an exception might be up here at the Minnesota-Iowa border, but that's a subject for another talk. Where you see the red is where big-headed carps are super abundant. Yellow is where there is some reproduction. And blue is where some rare individual captures of adults can occur. Uh, ignore these the parts on the Missouri River and the lower part of the Mississippi River because that's not really included in this uh, status estimate. One of the reasons that the populations tend to be scant where the in these blue sections is they're upriver and they, it's due to that life cycle of the fish. And if, if they, even if they pull off a spawn up there, the larvae drift so far downstream that they're, you know, they're, they move into the yellow and red sections. And then the, the, you know, the adults have to work their way back upstream through all these dams. Those little black things on there are dams and they have to work their way up and up through those dams to get into those sections. Also in the upper reaches of the Illinois River, uh, which is, joins the bottom of uh, Lake Michigan there, um, it, it, there is a harvest program designed to keep populations low near the barrier in Romeoville and near Chicago, which is the only substantial remaining point where carp could conceivably swim through from the, M the Mississippi River Basin to the Great Lakes Basin. Next slide. So this is a map of the Chicago area where they, that one uh, remaining water connection exists where carp could swim through. And the lightning bolts there, uh, the sort of the bottom left, uh, indicate that the electric, that's where the electric barrier is in Romeoville. There's only been one big head and one silver carp captured on the wrong side of this electric barrier in any waters that are connected to Lake Michigan. And you can see that there have been only one big head and one silver carp downstream of those, elect, um, uh, those uh, that barrier there. Uh, that are really close to it. And then as you move down towards the very bottom left corner, it looks like the fish are stacked up there below Brandon Road Lock and Dam. But that's not really the way to look at this. In that area below Brandon Road Lock and Dam map, the, the carp are 
relatively low abundance compared to places where carp are reproductive. And there's a concentrated contract fishing effort going on there to keep the population pressure low in the region of the barrier. And those catches that you see are largely due to that contract fishing. The effort seems to be having really substantial success at keeping the carp numbers low. And unlike every other dam on the Illinois River to get past Brandon Road Lock and Dam, uh, which is right, you know, again, right next to that uh, pile of fish there, uh, the fish have to lock through. There are no conditions where fish can swim over the dam. And we've been studying for years how to best keep big headed carp from locking through places. And this year, uh, Congress set out $226 million to install those deterrents in Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So once those deterrents are in place, and while there will still be a way potentially for a carp to swim through into the Great Lakes Basin, it's going to be quite a gauntlet. They have to not get caught. They have to lock through at Brandon Road, something that very few fish have done anyway. And they have to get through three consecutive electric barriers in the Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal, and then work their way through the waterway system and make it to Lake Michigan. I'm not saying that all this is cheap. But there is a lot going on to keep the carp out of the Great Lakes. Next slide. So the dark gray area in the middle is the basin, is, is the watershed of the Great Lakes Basin. Water to the south of that area flows away and towards the Mississippi River or the Atlantic Ocean. The, the numbered circles uh, indicate places in, where, in addition to the Chicago waterway, where under some hydrologic conditions in the past carp could have swam through to the Great Lakes. But these are these have been effectively closed off now using primarily engineering methods like earthen berms. Red triangles are big head carp captures, yellow is silver carp, and green is grass carp captures. Of course, not every big head or silver carp of the millions captured in the Mississippi River Basin is included in this map. But within the Great Lakes Basin, this is most of the captured fish up until a little over a year ago. So you can see that there have been grass carp captured in every Great Lake except for Superior. Grass carp have been captured in the Great Lakes Basin since the early 1980s, and Lake Erie accounts for most of those captures. Next slide. So zooming in on Lake Erie, you can see that there's a fair number of grass carp that have been caught in Lake Erie and its tributaries, and they're so piled up on top of each other that you can't see you know, most of the fish that have been captured. Um, a special note, there were three big head carp also captured in Lake Erie, but these were all more than 20 years ago. We don't know how they got there, but if they were still getting to the Great Lakes through that pathway, or if they were still present and reproductive, someone would, would have caught another one in the last 20 years. Notably, these were really large, robust fat fish, and if anybody doubts that food resources would be inadequate for them there, think again. Next slide. So there's the DNA controversy. Interpretation of the environmental DNA results is very fraught and very controversial, but it does give us clues as to where live fish might be. This is the DNA, environmental DNA, is DNA given off by organisms, which can be carried around in a number of ways. In the case of carp, the water sampled and analyzed for the presence of DNA from the target species. But then you know, we don't know if that uh, DNA got there because there's a live carp there, dead carp, feces of birds that ate carp, lots of other potential vectors and fomites for eDNA. But when you see, keep seeing it in the same place again, then you have to worry. Uh, next slide. There have been almost 200 big headed carp eDNA positive detections in the Chicago area waterway system among thousands of samples. But the massive biomass of carp not too far away from there, uh, because of that biomass, there are, there are many ways that DNA could have been moved around. So it's really, really hard to interpret those data. Uh, some people point to the single big head and silver carp captured in the cause as confirmation that eDNA means live fish. But the number of people that believe that eDNA collections nearly always mean live fish is dwindling. And then in Lake Erie, further from this giant biomass of, of wild big-headed carp, there have been only a few detections. They, these are hard to ex, harder to explain away as being non-live um, fish, but they are very few, and there are potential alternative explanations for those eDNA collections. Next slide. So we don't really know what those mean, 
uh, those detections mean. Uh, at least most of us aren't sure. Um, we, I do think there's a bottom line, though, that we can be relatively sure of. While big-headed carp can be quite difficult to detect, especially in a huge system such as the Great Lakes or like even Lake Erie, if there's any out there, they are few and they don't seem to be spawning and recruiting yet. Next slide. So now, um, grass carp catches in the Great, Lark Great Lakes Basin have been happening occasionally since 1980s, but that's not really extremely su surprising because people have been stocking sterile triploid grass carp in farm ponds within the basin since the sterile triploids first became available in, in about 1983. When grass carp were captured, it was na natural to write them off as escapees from, from pond stocking. Then in 2012, some small grass carp were captured in the Sandusky Basin that for various reasons raised an eyebrow. So we looked into it and were able to show through forensic fishery scientists me science methods that these fish were sterile they were not sterile. They were born in and had lived their entire lives in the Sandusky River Basin. This was published about three months after a USGS pub that used the flu egg model to show that big-headed carp could potentially spawn and reproduce in the Sandusky River. Because the early life requirements of these fish are so similar to those of big-headed carps, this grass carp publication could be seen as validation of the model prediction meaning that not only are grass carp reproducing in the Great Lakes, the big-headed carps could also probably do the same if they invaded in su sufficient numbers to spawn. So this created quite a stir and people started to pay a lot more attention to grass carp in the Great Lakes. Next slide. So here are the numbers of reported grass carp captures in the Lake Erie Basin since the uh, mid 1980s. Sorry for not making a new fixture to encompass uh, 2020 and 2021, which you see on the right. Uh, in this figure, the dark gray on the top are sterile triploid fish, the light gray are diploid fish, and the black is unknown ploidy. Uh, I guess that these, I, I stress that these are reported captures and both reporting and effort by state and federal groups to capture fish increased tremendously after the events of 2012 and 2013. So it's hard to tell if we're looking at the early evidence of a population explosion or if the increase over the last 10 years is just because of increased re reporting and or effort. Also note that 2019 is kind of an outlier, uh, both in number of fish caught, which is more than 180, and in the proportion of sterile triploids in the catch also. But in all other years, the catch has been bobbing around at less than uh, 100 grass carp total, and on average, about two thirds of them have been fertile diploids. Next slide. So, where are they coming from? Uh, Greg Whitledge took oglets from about 100 grass carp captured in the Lake Erie Basin, and about two thirds of those were fertile diploid, diploids. Of course, the oxygen, oxygen isotope information from the triploids indicated that they were from aquaculture because spontaneous triploidy almost never occurs in the wild, but of the diploid fish, only 20 of 66 were from aquaculture. So that's an indication that not only is there substantial reproduction going on in the Great Lakes Basin, but also there still have been some diploid fish getting in, which, shouldn't, which should only have been able to happen illegally or through some accident. Also, most of the grass carp uh, that were wild produced, you, uh, came from either the Maumee or the Sandusky River based on chemical signatures in the otoliths. But there were a couple that were apparently spawned somewhere else. So that there is at least one other river in the Great Lakes where grass carp was spawning with relatively low frequency or success. We don't know where, but it's likely out there. Uh, and um, I should mention that spawning in the Maumee and the Sandusky Rivers has also been confirmed by the capture of eggs and larvae there but to date, no other river has been identified as a source. Furthermore, this and other studies have shown that 2011 was an important year for the reproduction of grass carp. While grass carp are reproducing in these two rivers in other years, it's clear that not every year is a good reproduction year for grass carp in the Great Lakes Basin. Next slide. So when we were first looking at where invasive carps might spawn in the Great Lakes Basin, Every expert you asked would bring up the Maumee as the most likely location. 
But when we did these these uh, egg drift models, uh, the, they said that you know that mommy was kind of meh compared to the Sandusky, and that and the data from that we've got more recently from captured grass carp have brought have borne that out. Still, even the Sandusky requires something of a Goldilocks conditions to produce even moderate survival of carp offspring. These two rivers are probably the best places for invasive carps to reproduce in the Great Lakes Basin, but even those are not optimal locations. Furthermore, the climate of the region means that those Goldilocks conditions have a relatively short position, a period in which to occur. That just a, the time interval is, uh, uh, is short. Further south, Carp might spawn anywhere from May to September. That's what we can get in Missouri. But in Lake Erie Basin, they're pretty much limited to July and August and most years, unless we get global warming. Next slide. So what are we doing about it? Uh, we can and, and we are doing something, something about this. When these fish were brought in to the United States, uh, we didn't know anything about these fish. I mean, I was, I've been really interested in these fish for, you know, more than 20 years by far. Um, I've, I've had a file on these fish since the 1980s, but there really wasn't much out there in English to, uh, about these fish. And the, the, the Chinese literature was all about farming them. So in the last 20 years, uh, tax dollars and intensive research has changed that a lot. We know a lot about carp. And so, because we know a lot about carp, we can do things to control that reproduction. And um, one of the things that's underway for the Great Lakes is, is that there's plans for a barrier to spawning migrations underway. And the funding is expected to be available. So invasive carp spawn much later in the year than native fishes, so the barrier can be activated at times with very little effect on native fish migrations. This is unlikely to be an electric barrier, which uh, we're focusing on less expensive and less dangerous options, including bubble and sound and light barriers. These can be coupled with mechanisms to trap migrating adult fish using behavioral barriers to guide the moving adult fish into traps where they can be sorted from native fish. And it's even possible that within a couple of years, uh, very close to from now, we might be possible to include developing and really exciting technology to use bubble arrays to capture eggs and larvae as they drift downstream. Those are technologies that are in development, but I think we're getting close. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put, pull this all together. The bad news is that we've had some median A hits. Uh, the good news is that there's no really any evidence of big headed carp fit, uh, out there and the, uh, other than the eDNA. Uh, uh, the bad news, again, it's possible that a small number of big headed carp might exist in or enter the Great Lakes, but the good news is that invasive carps are mass spawners, and the lakes are big. There's a lot of places for them to go. Not only is it maybe tough for them to find each other, a small number of big head carp that we know was introduced because we caught three of them out there um, it was not adequate to establish, and you know, I, one would hate to, you know, take chances, but it, it, there's a very good chance that if a small number of, of carp was introduced again, uh, that they would also not be able to establish just because it takes a lot of fish. Um, we don't know how many fish were introduced. We know that there were three caught, but we're pretty sure it wasn't, we, you know, that only three fish were out there. I mean, that would be extremely unlikely. Next slide. So, <clears throat> The bad news is that we do have grass carp reproducing in the Great Lakes Basin, but the good news is that they're still few. A lot of them are sterile. The fact that a lot of these fish are sterile might actually impede the reproductive success of the diploids that are out there because, you know, if you have sterile male, you've probably heard of the sterile male usage uh, that in interferes with reproduction. So, and one of the things too is that now that people are more concerned about grass carp, I think it's, it's my personal opinion, but I think it's likely going to result in a, a higher um, level of attention to detail uh, and less likely that people will be importing uh, diploid grass carp into the system. So we're probably not gonna get as much of that as happened in the past. Next slide. 
So uh, the bad news is that uh, we have a, at least a few places that are okay for spawning. Uh, but the good news is that those spawning rivers are not excellent and they're small enough that we can do things with those barriers. We can't you know, do things like that in the Mississippi River Basin because we're up against giant rivers and huge, um, uh, just huge numbers of fish. But in the Great Lakes, we can do things that we can't possibly do in um, the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, big head and grass carp captured from the Great Lakes are all robust. You know, uh, there was quite a bit of skepticism early on as to whether these fish could uh, find what they needed to eat. But uh, that's really, I think, a, a red herring. But we do have new, new knowledge of carp biology, ecology, and behavior that allows us to design appropriate barriers and controls. And we seem to have the willpower uh, to get it done because the money is being obligated. Uh, next slide. So to wrap it all up, uh, grass carp and big headed carps do not, uh, do uh, pose a substantial risk to the Great Lakes. There definitely could be problems if you didn't pay attention to this, but the game isn't over. And I think we're gonna win it in the Great Lakes. The Laurentian Great Lakes pose a reproductive challenge to the carps that we can exploit. And we have uh, controls that are, uh, that are coming up and controls that are underway in terms of capture and uh, deployment of, of uh, technology that will impede reproduction. It might take us a few tries, but I think in the Great Lakes, we do, we're gonna get this. And that's all, that's what I have. Thank you so much, Dwayne. What a, an amazing presentation. And with that, I think we're gonna have to skip our uh, break in between. So hopefully I can launch that poll later because it is all about invasive carp and testing your knowledge. So uh, we'll skip on to Lauren Wobig and he is the director of the Office of Water Resources at the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Lauren is responsible for overseeing all planning, design, operations, water supply, Lake Michigan water allocation and coastal programs, dam safety, and floodplain regulatory programs in Illinois. He also serves as an Illinois commissioner and chair of the Illinois delegation on the Great Lakes Commission and as Governor Pritzker's representative on the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premier's Compact Council. Lauren is an Illinois licensed professional engineer and certified floodplain manager and has ha held several leadership positions in the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Illinois Association for Floodplain and Stormwater Management. Lauren Wobig received his Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from Iowa State University in 1984 and has worked for the Office of Water Resources in various regula regulatory and project management capacities for 37 years. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss the Brandon Road project. Great, thank you, Amber. Uh, and I, once in a while, I try to actually get some sleep in there as well, but not very often. Uh, and so I uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today and kind of give an update of where we're at in the, the Brandon Road uh, project. And uh, if, particularly from uh, the non-federal sponsors perspective, which as you mentioned, I work for the state of Illinois and the state of Illinois serves as that, that non-federal sponsor role. Um, uh, so I don't know, Amber, are you gonna bring up the slides? That's up to you. Would you like me to share or I can give you sharing abilities? Um, why don't you go ahead and bring them up if you okay. would? Yeah, and I uh, like, uh, Tim mentioned earlier, you know, every time I hear presentations like the one we just heard, you know, I, I too learn more and more about about uh, invasive carp. Uh, so, yeah, as Amber mentioned, I'm a I'm a civil engineer uh, by training. So I'm a civil engineer kind of thrust into the world of um, fisheries and <laughs> an invasive species. And uh, so I, every day is kind of a learning experience. Uh, which keeps it uh, interesting and exciting. So today, what I'd like to do uh, briefly is kind of go through, like I mentioned, where we're at uh, and what's happening. Uh, 
uh, as the, the presentation is titled, kind of the research design and challenges. And, and of course, a project of this magnitude and this importance uh, wouldn't be a project if it, if it didn't have some, some key challenges. So we'll touch on a few of those today as well. If you could advance the slide. So uh, for those of you uh, unfamiliar um, with kind of the location or where this has at, um, Brand the Brandon Road project gets its namesake from uh, Brandon Road, which as you look at the uh, photograph there on the right hand side of the slide, you see kind of a, a, road, a road running diagonal through the middle of the picture. Uh, that is Brandon Road. Uh, it actually crosses the, the lock chamber entrance uh, with a lift bridge at that point, but that's where it gets its namesake. And so you can see the, the lock and dam configuration there. And at this point, uh, it, it is on the Desplaines River uh, after you know coming up out of the Illinois, uh, the Desplaines and the Kankakee come together to form the Illinois. So we're above that confluence in the Joliet area. Uh, for those of you that have been through this region, uh, the photo that we see here on the slide is just downstream of where Interstate 80 crosses over the Desplaines River uh, in the Joliet area. And the reason that this site uh, was selected by Congress and become so pivotal is because there is a rather tall dam located at this site, uh, tall enough that the invasive carp are unable to jump over it even during high flow flood events uh, like a 500 year event. So it truly becomes a barrier that forces all movement of species uh, through the lock up and down this river system. And that makes it, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of a key pinch point in the system to incorporate the, this gauntlet of technologies that we would put into uh, this approach channel to try and uh, prevent and, and deter uh, invasive species from moving further upstream and getting into the Great Lakes. So next slide, please. So you, uh, the great uh, Brandon Road project, we're in what's called the PED phase, which stands for pre-construction engineering and design. And that, that, uh, that particular phase uh, involves a 65-35 cost share between the federal government and the state of Illinois. Uh, of course, Michigan has stepped up in a big way uh, with $8 million in, in non-federal sponsor support. Uh, through an agreement that we, we signed with them. So the state of Illinois certainly appreciates uh, Michigan's in, in involvement there and their continued engagement in the design process. But this first phase, this first PED phase is really the first of three phases or three increments is what the core is calling them. Um, and so we're into the design of this first increment that represents about a third of the overall construction um, that it would be to get some initial um, acoustic speakers in there, some bubbler systems, um, potentially some um, uh, noise, the acoustics to, to give that initial deterrence to the fish. Uh, increments two and three involve more of the construction of a more permanent building for the control works and creating the flushing lock uh, condition to really try to get <clears throat> to deal with and manage uh, floaters and eggs and those kinds of um, invasives that aren't, you know, a full-size fish that we're trying to get to turn around. This first phase of uh, the design is, is uh, just almost $29 million and expected to take three years. And as part of that, we're getting land rights and doing physical modeling and testing and, and really doing a lot of the design for this first phase and uh, initiating some of the design for increments or phases two and three. Next slide, please. So a lot of my presentation is going to be focused on kind of where we're at with this first increment uh, and being in PED. Now, of course, last week was a, a big week in terms of announcements uh, from the Illinois infrastructure, from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and that included Brandon Road uh, funding and a congressional new start for that project, uh, funding just shy of 226 million. And that really is to 
fund the remainder of design for increment one and getting into some construction dollars for this first increment of the project. You know, overall, the project probably is, is still approaching upwards of a billion dollars in total, uh, but this first increment, uh, Congress supplied this level of funding to try to get that portion of it to fruition. Now, what that means for the state of Illinois is that by, I'm not sure if it's by uh, actual legislation or, or just policy, but the core is now requiring the state of Illinois to enter into a project partnership by the end of this calendar year. Um, of course, that PPA agreement, which as I'll get into, has some issues with it. But once the state of Illinois were to sign that agreement, that locks in the state of Illinois as the sponsor for all remaining design, about $70 million worth of remaining design in total, and then all 20% uh, of all remaining uh, construction yet to come. Uh, but it, it terminates that PED uh, agreement and arrangement, and then it also uh, term it would terminate our agreement with Michigan for their participation. Now, I'm uh, hopeful that Michigan, uh, because of their interest and desire to see actions here, will continue to put forth uh, the dollars that they've de dedicated, but it will require Illinois and Michigan to negotiate uh, a new agreement on how we establish that kind of an arrangement. So the actions last week uh, did kind of change the, the ball game a little bit in terms of what we are focused on and what we have to deal with in terms of the the PET agreement that was set in place here uh, a year ago or more. Next slide, please. And so as a result of that, as I mentioned, you know, the Word of 2020 uh, set up the cost sharing arrangement uh, for an 80-20 federal state cost share agreement. Uh, we're still looking at a significant expenditure for the remaining design and certainly the construction of this project. And due to its, you know, the regional benefits that we would expect from the construction and implementation of this project, uh, the regional benefits, we're looking at why wouldn't this be a, a federal uh, project, very similar to what the uh, Great Lakes States region did for the Sioux Locks, and then even more recently, what was done for the electric barrier uh, that exists in Romeoville, Illinois, that, that serves as that same deterrent to block invasives from moving either upstream or downstream in the Chicago area waterway. And so back in December, uh, all eight uh, Great Lakes states governors uh, went together into a letter uh, to uh, the heads of the Environmental uh, and Public Works Committee on the Senate side and the Transportation Infrastructure Committees on the uh, House side uh, asking for full federal funding. And so that is an ongoing push uh, that that continued collaboration uh, continues to go on that as we try to encourage uh, the congressional offices to include that kind of language in WERDA 2022 that's currently being developed. And of course, we would ask that all, uh, really all aspects, including the remaining design, the land rights, you know, permitting construction, and certainly the operation, uh, maintenance, rehab, rehabilitation, and full replacement uh, be covered by the federal government uh, at the end of the, the PED term. Um, and of course, that uh, we're also within Word of 22. As I mentioned, there are some challenges associated with signing uh, project partnership agreements with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, they're not exactly the, the best partner to do business with from that perspective when it comes to holding states, uh, some liabilities for the states that are challenging for states and really holding uh, the non-federal sponsor responsible for uh, all you know, the OM, RR, and R in perpetuity instead of a defined project life. So there is language drafted that we're hoping to get into Word of 22 as well to make signing that project partnership agreement uh, easier to swallow. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, though, we, we haven't signed a, the project partnership agreement yet. So we are still in the, the PED phase of Brandon Road for the pre-construction engineering and design. And, and what does that entail? Well, uh, design meetings and charrettes. In fact, uh, right now, as we speak, uh, they're having their fifth 
design charrette at the electric barrier there in Romeoville focused on uh, facilities uh, type of, of uh, considerations, you know, building size, uh, site layout, many of those types of considerations are being discussed this week by the, the Corps and, and the state of Illinois teams. Uh, the PED process all, also involves uh, acquiring and negotiating for land rights and, and doing the testing. And so um, not all of the land at, at Brandon Road uh, needed for the project is, is in uh, government ownership at this point. Uh, the state of Illinois, uniquely enough, owns all of the property under which uh, the federal government has their, their lock and their, the dam set up there. Uh, and we own some of the property downstream of the lock as well, but not the entire reach needed for some of the components that we'd like to put into this project. And so that requires the state of Illinois to negotiate and acquire land rights. Most of those land rights are, head, are held by NRG, Midwest Generation uh, Energy Company. And so uh, we've been in negotiations with them. Uh, that site that we're looking at needing to acquire has had an interesting history in terms of energy production. And there is the possibility that, that uh, coal ash and other contaminants may be on this property. And so the state of Illinois is kind of posed, uh, poised to go onto the property and do some geotechnical and environmental testing to answer those questions. Um, but we need that right of access from the company to do that. And so that's what we're currently trying to negotiate. And of course, um, they have some non-disclosure terms that they want included in that. Uh, they're basically saying, Illinois, you may go look at that property, you may go poke around, but if you find something, keep it to yourself. You're not allowed to share that with anybody, including the core or even ourselves, uh, you know, the company. Um, we want that uh, to be kept um, under wraps and, and for your information only. So we're trying to negotiate those terms with the company as well. And um, it's, it's been very slow going. Uh, it gets into the, the realm of the attorneys trying to negotiate those terms and uh, not moving fast enough for, for my liking, but, but that's what we have to deal with as we try to move forward is to get those uh, access agreements resolved so that we can get on there and, and see what, if any contaminants we're facing and, and then figure out how to deal with that if we do discover any of that. And then of course, uh, research uh, continues and I'll get into that in a little bit more here in my presentation uh, related to the deterrence that we're trying to incorporate for this project and then outreach as well. Next slide, please. So uh, starting with the communication, which is obviously uh, key to everything we do. And, and the reason I'm, I'm speaking to you folks uh, this afternoon, uh, it's so important to make sure that we have the transparency and keep everybody up to speed on, on how things are progressing and, and what's going on there. And so that's being done through um, you know, presentations like this, um, through forums, uh, the state of Illinois and the state of Michigan have created a, a states and forums, um, states and provinces forum, excuse me, that brings key representatives uh, together, some of who are on this call this afternoon, uh, to talk as a, a regional collection of states on, on how we deal with uh, uh, fulfilling the non-federal sponsor requirements that are currently before us. Uh, workshops are conducted, particularly navigation workshops to get industries input into how uh, what we're trying to accomplish at Brandon Road would impact navigation. Obviously from the fisheries perspective, uh, this project intends to not just stop invasive species, but stop everything. And so that creates a, a, you know, a distinctive um, change in, in what happens in that ecosystem uh, that we need to figure out. And so workshops are conducted with with those kinds of you know, biologists and, and fisheries experts to help uh, shed some light on, on the best, best, best pathway forward in that manner as well. Of course, what's shown here on the right-hand side of the screen is a sample of the uh, newsletter that's put out uh, by the Corps in the state of Illinois quarterly to try and provide some uh, printed information, some update on, on status. But more importantly, uh, really at the request of the state of Illinois and the state of Michigan, uh, we are holding uh, webinars shortly after each newsletter comes out to really encourage that uh, two-way communication and to give 
interested uh, parties and stakeholders that voice to, to ask questions and, and voice into the process. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, it involves uh, the soils and environmental uh, data collection. Um, what you see here on, on the slide uh, in the aerial photo, the area that is kind of a blue gray color there uh, near the top of the photo, that is what the feasibility report from the Corps identified as potential land required uh, for this project. Uh, the red kind of highlights the peninsula uh, that we're dealing with as well. Um, that, that is involved in, in the project. And so that's what we're trying to negotiate land rights on. Um, the state of Illinois only owns downstream um, just, just a little ways, um, maybe a third of that distance downstream. And, and the remainder of that is the NRG uh, Midwest Gen property. Next slide, please. And so, of course, research, uh, and this is a big part of this. This is actually kind of the, the most fun, if you will, the most interesting uh, part of being engaged in this project is a lot of the research that's, that's going on in a, in a big scale. Uh, starting at the upper uh, left-hand corner there, uh, that's Lock and Dam 19 on the Mississippi, and that is where they are lowering an acoustics bar of speakers into the approach channel there. And so that's been in place and, and being monitored uh, for several months now and is providing really some valuable information, not only from how effective sound is at, at turning around uh, the invasive uh, species there, but how well does it, how well does it function? You know, how, how robust uh, are the speakers? What kind of issues, what kind of implementation issues do we get into? So a lot of great lessons being learned there in Keokuk, Iowa, with that kind of prototype system in the Mississippi River approach channel to Lock and Dam 19. Of course, down at, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> down at the Corps Research Center in Vicksburg, um, we have modeling going on there that is testing in these flumes, you know, the impact and of bubbles and uh, really how does that impact not only the fish, but how would that impact uh, barges or even uh, jet skis, you know, or kayaks down to that level. Uh, how would that impact those kinds of uh, public water uses with a, a bubbler system in place? Uh, the lower uh, lower left corner there shows uh, Peoria Lock and Dam, uh, which it is the intent to install a prototype uh, there of a bubbler system, and then uh, have contractual uh, barge operators running back and forth over some of these bubble deterrent systems really looking there to install a, what we're calling the ABCD um, deterrent, but that's large bubbles that would try to displace the fish from the gaps between the, the raked front and the, and the flat back of a barge system uh, so that the barge doesn't uh, unintentionally carry an invasive species through a deterrent. Next slide, please. And of course, then uh, more physical modeling down at Erdic. This is a couple of slides showing uh, the construction of that, uh, of the physical model that goes from upstream of the lock and dam to about a mile downstream of the approach channel. Uh, that's all been, you know, surveyed. And what you see there on the right-hand side is a, you know, a lathe cutting those contours into uh, plastic blocks that then go together to form the model. Uh, next slide. And so this is uh, this was from just before Christmas. Um, the model was uh, assembled and painted and sealed, um, and showing this is looking downstream uh, from just up upstream of the the lock that you can see there, kind of in the the forefront of the picture, going into that. Um, uh, approach channel, and you can see that the divider peninsula there in green, kind of separating the, the river from the approach channel. And then uh, the, you see a little piece of the dam there in the, the lower right hand corner. You know, interestingly enough, this, uh, this model is, is robust enough, you can get up and walk around on it. And, you know, once they put all those blocks together to create this scaled model, uh, they actually code it with like a pickup truck bed liner kind of material. 
uh, that gives it a lot of uh, strength and durability. So we had probably 30 people walking around this model uh, at this time in December, right after it was assembled. Uh, but that's what we'll be using to, this represents existing conditions. Uh, and on the photo there, looking kind of on the right side of the photo, you can see kind of some side uh, backwater area that is part of the NRG Midwest Generation facility. That's their intake and outlet structures for their uh, power company. And so the kind of detail and the existing uh, piers and uh, that are in the, the channel there already are, are modeled to scale. And then uh, we'll be <clears throat> modifying this model again. It's built in blocks so they can pull out individual uh, pieces and replace them with uh, modified blocks that would represent proposed conditions uh, onto this modeling system. Next slide, please. Uh, from the, the uh, non-federal state of Illinois perspective, um, I wanna hit on kind of where we go with uh, public water regulations because it does impact <clears throat> how and what this project becomes. And so uh, in my job, I, I wear two hats, not only a, a capital, uh, let's go build projects kind of a, a hat, uh, which has me involved on the Brandon, Brandon Road design team as a member there, but I, I wear the regulatory hat for waterways in the state of Illinois as well. And so from my position, I'm, I'm charged to, uh, by statute, jealously guard and vigilantly protect uh, the rights and the interests of the public on these designated public bodies of water uh, and the natural resources thereof. And of course you can, um, the slide illustrates the varied interests that you know, we can get into from you know, canoeing to hunting, to fishing, to boating, to swimming, to even you know, enjoying the aesthetics of the public water all taken into account. And so this law requires that you must, regardless of whether you're talking about a Brandon Road invasive species project or any kind of a, a project that you would do on these public waters, you first need to avoid impacts to the public use and, and where you can't avoid it, you need to minimize those impacts. And then we're, after you've minimized impacts to the greatest practical extent, then you need to mitigate uh, in essence and, and make the public whole at the end of the day for those impacts. And so I look at it kind of like a legal balance. And so for every uh, impact that you make to the waterway on one side of the scale, you need to have uh, some sort of benefit to the public on the other to balance that out. Next slide, please. And of course, with all those you know, varied uses that you know, can get into to swimming and, and all sorts of things, uh, for the benefit of the project, the state of Illinois has narrowed those considerations or concerns down to these six uh, key topic areas, the public safety, obviously, navigation, uh, public water access, and uh, excuse me, um, transportation and recreation and, and then aquatic species movement. And so that's, that's where the design team is focused on what, how are we impacting uh, those six things and, and what can we do to offset those kinds of impacts. Next slide, please. We also need to give consideration to uh, floodway regulations, much like uh, you know you would have in, in the other states as well, uh, more from the FEMA perspective. This slide kind of shows the regulatory floodway map uh, through the Brandon Road site there. Again, you can kind of see Brandon Road cutting diagonally through the middle of this uh, photo here, this map. Uh, where I've circled there is really that project area. And you can see that that cross-hatching area crosses into our project site. Um, originally, this was creating some consternation because in Illinois, uh, particularly in Northeastern Illinois, we regulate very specific kinds of uses in the floodway and building a wall uh, to contain deterrence for invasive species uh, was not a, a defined appropriate use. Uh, so began to see that as a challenge. Um, fortunately, as we continue to gather more um, site information, uh, topography information at that location, uh, we learned that that divider peninsula is in fact uh, taller than what was depicted or, or envisioned in this mapping. And so the design team is going through the uh, hydraulic uh, map change and, and hydraulic 
uh, modeling exercises right now to get a letter of, of map amendment and map revision uh, for this site that removes the floodway out of our project site and eases those kinds of concerns and lets us move forward. So uh, good news there. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, tied in with those um, regulatory considerations really ties in nicely with the social and environmental justice considerations that you know we need to have in mind as we go forward in developing this project. Um, it's taken some push from the states to you know to get the core uh, to go this way, uh, but but we're making headway in that regard. Um, the best way to really illustrate that for this project is that today, um, of course, this in Joliet and this area is kind of a disadvantaged area uh, in the state. And there are a number of individuals that are fishing uh, at this site, not just for sport, but for actual sustenance, right? Getting their evening meal. So uh, shame on us if we somehow impact uh, that ability to, to have that kind of public access and use uh, when, you know, there are folks using that actually for their food sustenance. Next slide, please. So one of the ways, and I just introduced this concept yesterday uh, to the Corps of Engineers team, but um, we came up with, the state of Illinois came up with the idea about, well, education um, is part of the non-structural um, components that are authorized for the Brandon Road project. So uh, when Congress authorized Brandon Road, it included both structural and non-structural considerations. And within that non-structural, education was certainly uh, the number one item listed for non-structural measures. Um, and so the opportunity that came up to say, well, hey, uh, with all the attention that's drawn to this project and this project site, um, why not give consideration to incorporating um, an education center um, at the Brandon Road project site that educates the public not only about uh, invasive carp, but all invasive species, you know, plants included, and why it's so important to need to manage and control those, and why we end up spending millions and millions of dollars uh, in an effort to control an invasive species at this site. Um, and so, you know, this kind of a uh, this is being considered, of course, this week as we're talking about what, what kind of buildings or what should the building include. At Brandon Road, Lock and Dam, unlike many other uh, of the Corps' Lock and Dam sites, there is no visitor center per se at this site. And so uh, would incorporate kind of a, a core visitor center like they have at many of the other dams into a, a public education center as well. Uh, so we're floating that idea as part of the non-structural uh, component to this project, uh, perhaps providing some fishing piers like is shown on the, the left-hand uh, side of the slide here. Again, that goes back to maintaining public access. If we are, by the nature of our project, um, taking away public access, public use of a particular piece of this waterway uh, for, you know, for our purposes of, of preventing Asian uh, invasive carp from moving upstream, how do we offset that? And so this just shows some of those ideas uh, on ways that we can do that, uh, provide these benefits. And of course, uh, implementing these kind of uh, measures both inside a building or outside, like some of these uh, signage show um, in the outside environment, uh, trying to educate the public, that all go, counts towards um, a better, you know, uh, providing a benefit to the public on a public water. Next slide, please. So this just kind of gives a, a, in a very generic sense, uh, the scheduling of the, the project. Of course, we're into to PED, which is kind of the top half of this slide. Uh, we've talked about the land rights and, and gathering, you know, data and modeling that's ongoing, uh, initiating some of the, the plans for this increment one of three increments and then looking towards uh, the need to sign a, a project partnership agreement. Um, we're looking to have some key dates here, looking to complete uh, plans and specifications for this first increment in uh, the federal fiscal year 24, really probably looking, uh, have a goal at the moment of perhaps around September of 2024, 
uh, having uh, plans and specs completed. Uh, obviously then for a, a increment one construction award in FY24 with then continued uh, design of the remaining two increments and construction. And here's where the core is projecting that to go out to uh, about FY32. Next slide, please. Of course, while all this is going on, you know, from the um, structural side of things, uh, the authorization also included enhanced uh, non-structural, and, and that uh, means that we continue to enhance the efforts that uh, the collective groups of U.S. Fish and Wildlife and State of Illinois and, and many other agencies are doing to, you know, do the uh, commercial fishing, the overfishing to control populations in the Illinois River uh, as a means to keep these fish at bay while we design this uh, additional deterrent and this additional measure in a system of measures uh, to try and ensure that we're able to keep invasive carp out of the Great Lakes. So that, that goes on as well. And, and this project will essentially continue to put support and effort into uh, trying to even beef that up a little further. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned that, you know, that, that some of the challenges besides some of the land rights challenges and, and site design challenges I've already mentioned, um, you know, we do have challenges with the existing project partnership agreements uh, that the core standard uh, typically uses for standard projects in terms of some of the hold harmless provisions and some of the, um, you know, operation maintenance and, and full replacement in perpetuity considerations. Um, we have asked the Corps, couldn't we do business better if we have done, uh, did multiple project partnership agreements, say for each increment, then the state or the non-federal sponsor and support partners can, uh, you know, commit to each step as we move forward, rather than uh, signing off for the whole enchilada with no clue as to how much money and, and effort would be required to do that. So that's why I've mentioned that some of those uh, are being escalated the, as a mega project. The core defines Brandon Road as one of their mega project that, that creates this issue escalation process, uh, which gives us a ladder to raise these type of issues from a, a staff design team level up to the highest levels through the governor's office and uh, the ASA within the, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and so the first one that we've raised dealt with some of these concerns in the project partnership agreement. And the second one we raised was this idea of needing to abide by uh, Illinois laws and regulations um, in the state of Illinois. And, you know, because the core uh, initially intended not to um, get any state of Illinois permits, um, but uh, as, as history would have it back in 1979, uh, the core and, and some counties in Illinois uh, set out to make some drastic uh, changes to the Mackinac River. Uh, they were sued uh, by, back then it was the Illinois Department of Conservation and others. Uh, and as a result of that lawsuit, a, a, a decree or a, a settlement agreement was reached uh, wherein the Corps of Engineers agreed to for ecosystem projects on public waters in the state of Illinois they would abide by Illinois law and, and seek Illinois permits. And so, and then the US District Court affirmed that settlement into what's known as the Mackinac Decree. And so that's what the state of Illinois has in its hands, maybe separate from all other states across the nation when it comes to dealing with the core and, and state uh, sovereignty and state permitting issues. Uh, Cause many times the federal government can claim that federal superiority, but in this instance, uh, and as it applies to the Brandon Road project being an ecosystem project and on a designated public waterway in the state of Illinois, we're faced with uh, needing to abide by the terms of this 1979 uh, U.S. District uh, Court Consent Decree. And, and so that's being wrestled with as an escalated issue as well. Uh, raised from the design team up through the level of command. And so those are, are both going through that process right now uh, in hopes to get resolution uh, in, you know, well in time to keep everything on schedule. Next slide, please. 
So with that, uh, I'll conclude with a bit of an update. Um, certainly open to answer any questions that, that folks might have uh, as to where we're at and where we're headed or, and or why. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, excellent presentation. And yet another one that I, I've seen probably maybe 20 times. And I learn something new every time. And, um, you know, I, one thing I wanted to, to, to do first is, you know, you, when you speak about Illinois regulations, you speak about Illinois law, that's something that, that I know that, that you have always faithfully um, represented um, and spoke honestly about in, in interstate and, and international venues. And so first and foremost, thank you for your public service because um, Illinois couldn't do a lot of this without you. Um, you've, you've really been integral and been on the front lines of Brandon Road trying to protect the rest of the states, the provinces and, and the Great Lakes um, from an invasion of Asian carp. So, so really thank you. Um, you know, you, you touched on so many complexities of this project and I just wrote a few of these down um, as, as you were talking. And, and some of these complexities are engineering and technical based. You have brand spanking new uh, technology that is being um, modeled and tested and potentially installed at, at Brandon Road. You have your own state regulatory law and, and regulatory hurdles uh, that you have to go through. You have to take into account the, the needs and, and views of the other states that are working, uh, you know, along with you um, and, and, you know, kind of what, what their views of equity on funding. And, and that's a whole other thing is funding a billion dollar project you know, how you come up with those things. You have federal works requirements. Um, and then at the very end of the day, you have politics, which is, um, which, which is even more sometimes perplexing when you're working with the federal government. You know, so that being said, you know, if you could just kind of summarize, you know, looking at this project over the last several years and where we're at right now, what's the prospects of us getting this done and, and you getting what resources you need to get get this moving well I, i'm first of all encouraged by really the entire great lakes region speaking with one voice uh, on on the matter of hey congress um, this is important enough we should have full federal funding and so uh, i will share that you know the message i've gotten so far uh, from our congressionals is it's a very heavy lift you know to to make that ask but um, the fact that we've already, the governors have all, you know, signed a common letter to that effect. And, and really the region is speaking with a strong voice and one voice gives that a lot of, of oomph. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful still that, you know, full federal funding will come along. Um, unfortunately that even if we were to get that, I, I still have to stay engaged from the regulatory perspective. Um, but, um, you know, trying to, to ease our, our checkbook is, is critical there. Um, and I guess I, I do see that. I, I think that we've done it before as a region, right? The states have come together uh, on the Sioux locks. They've come together on the electric barrier that exists today in Romeoville uh, in cost-shared manner. Uh, we were fortunate in those cases to actually get those projects federalized, like we're trying to do now with Brandon Road. Um, but it, we have demonstrated as a collective a region that we are willing to uh, come together. I certainly appreciate the challenges that that puts on other states should we need to come up with some sort of a cost shared arrangement. That's very difficult to, you know, go to a general assembly and say, hey, we need dollars to give to another state, you know, for a project that's not within our political boundary. Uh, certainly can appreciate the complexities and challenges involved there. Um, but that's a bridge we'll cross, I guess, if we have to when we get there, but we've done it before. And so I think uh, we can get there again. Um, I'm certainly encouraged by, you know, the advancements we've made. Like I mentioned, the acoustics at Lock and Dam 19. We have some of this um, other technologies like at, at Barclay uh, in Kentucky, where they're implementing, you know, combinations of light and sound and bubbles together. Uh, in a proprietary kind of a product um, to, to prevent uh, and block 
uh, fish movement and, and we're learning so much. And so I think, you know, we have that to build off of that. I think that, uh, you know, having a combination of the acoustics and the bubbles in there will go a, a great distance to doing that. And uh, right now I, I'm seeing that moving ahead full speed that we should be able to, especially in increment one, be able to get something into the river uh, in, a, in a decent time period that will serve as a, as a real deterrent um, for the movement of invasive uh, species there. Uh, the land rights, you know, we have challenges with the uh, right descending bank where I said there may be coal ash, uh, you know, unknown contaminants that we still are trying to do our homework on. Um, we do have the divider peninsula. And so we've instructed the core, we as a design team have began looking at plan B, you know, if we have to locate um, some of the control works and facilities on that peninsula, that's certainly doable. And, and so I think uh, we will not be deterred if we do find uh, some uh, obstacles to using the, the property that I kind of showed there in that blue gray in, the, in my exhibit. Um, and so I, I'm encouraged that was, there are other ways to skin a cat, so to speak. And so uh, we're exploring all those and still moving forward. That was one thing I left off my list was, was some of the property complexities and contamination issues that you have to deal with. And th those are some of the biggest uh, roadblocks when you're trying to satisfy state regs there. Um, Amber, did you have any questions uh, for Lauren? Um, I, I do have questions, of course, but we are five minutes over the time. So if, if it's okay with you, we can move on to our next speaker, but I'll leave it up to you. There, there was one question that came in um, from Michelle Niedermeyer, and, and I'm not sure if you can speak to this, Lauren, but um, she states with respect to uh, environmental and social justice, how does the Justice 40 executive order um, impact projects such as this? It looks like uh, President Biden had um, completed an executive order and there's a there's a link there. So if you can't speak to that, um, feel free to per peruse the link um, and, and and add an answer in there. Um, but I guess I, in, in short, I'll just say, as I mentioned, that, you know, obviously that's a, a key consideration um, in the state of Illinois as well and from a state perspective. And so uh, we're certainly keeping that in the des design discussions. How do we, you know, not create adverse impacts in terms of some of that social justice perspective in a disadvantaged community. You know, the education center concept that I, I showed you briefly about, you know, creating a destination in a disadvantaged community that would bring uh, buses of school children to a site, you know, um, bring other visitors, uh, buying gas, you know, having lunch, what have you, uh, is all a boon to those kind of disadvantaged areas that could use something like that to uh, really address some of their uh, social needs that they have at hand as well. So I guess bottom line, we, we have not lost sight of that fact that that is a key component of what we need to address while we're looking at all the other technical uh, aspects of trying to put this project together. Thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us today. Um, following Lauren, we are going to come a little closer to home to talk about the Pennsylvania Governor's Invasive Species Council. I'm excited to introduce Chris Abel. He is the coordinator of this council. In addition to helping the council achieve its current initiatives, Chris is working on several other invasive species projects, including establishing a weed-free forage and gravel certification program, phasing out the use of invasive Phragmites in wastewater treatment plants, participating in the One Health Task Force, and consulting on the Controlled Plant and Noxious Weed Committee. Chris holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, a Master's of Science in Ecology and Environmental Science from the University of Maine, Orono, and a PhD in Entomology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Chris has a love for the outdoors and a strong conservation ethic that fuels his work as coordinator for the council. You can contact Chris through his email at krabell at pa.gov. And if anyone needs that, we can type it into the chat. Chris, thank you so much for being here today to talk about the Pennsylvania Invasive Species Council. That's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see if I can get the screen sharing to work here. Sounds good.
How's that? Looks good to me. Um, okay. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Um, looking forward to talking about the council and the work we're doing. Um, so I'll get started. Hopefully, let's see. Yes, so first, it's always good to start with uh, defining exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I'm gonna use a definition developed by the National Invasive Species Council. Um, an invasive species is any non-native species that causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal, or plant health. So I just put a bunch of pictures here, um, uh, just a few, just a very few examples of uh, invasive species we, we may be familiar with that, that are causing many problems uh, th throughout the United States. Um, but why do we have invasive species? Uh, how do they get here? Well, just a few things to keep in mind here. I always like to point out uh, globalization and, and, and international trade are huge. Um, shipping, uh, global shipping has more than doubled uh, in the past decade uh, from 4 billion tons to over 11 billion tons. So huge, huge increases in the amount of trade that's occurring. Uh, most of that is in container ships. Um, uh, over $3 trillion uh, worth of products just in 2021 alone in the United States um, have come in from other countries. And on average, there are about 172 ships uh, docking at a US port per day. Uh, that was the latest number I could find. That was in 2010. Um, undoubtedly, that's, that's gotten higher. So in, invasive species love to hitchhike. Um, they, they, whether it's in packaging material, on pallets, uh, on on uh, on, on uh, live plant material that's brought in, um, so many ways that invasive species get here. And every one of those uh, container ships or products that are imported contain the potential to introduce uh, an invasive species. Um, I, I suspect many, if not all, are very familiar with invasive species, but I, I like to run through a list anyway, just to remind us of all the impacts uh, that invasive species have and why they're so important. Um, firstly, they're, they're the second greatest contributor to biodiversity loss globally. And we, we've all heard uh, repeatedly in, in recent years how important biodiversity is to uh, the stability of our ecosystems and, and resiliency. Um, Invasive species are a primary driver uh, for threatened and endangered species and driving species to extinction. Uh, they can increase the frequency and intensity of wildfires. They increase the costs of uh, water and power. Um, we heard about some of those costs today with these uh, invasive carp projects. So, so huge costs. Um, Damage or and in, damage and increased maintenance costs for bridges, roads, and other human infrastructure. Um, invasive species degrade fishing, hunting, recreation opportunities. Uh, they can discourage tourism in certain circumstances. Um, and maybe most importantly, invasive species disrupt all the ecosystem services that that we depend on, that all life depends on, uh, to, to 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 function, to to live. Uh, uh, on, on the planet. So they can impair air and water quality. Um, they can impede uh, and disrupt uh, natural pest control. Uh, they can contribute to erosion, sedimentation, and flooding, altering soil chemistry and, and quality. They can alter and disrupt food webs, which can have repercussions uh, throughout the ecosystem. Uh, pollination, wildlife nutrition, uh, nutrient cycling in the environment, um, they also have direct human health impacts, uh, including acting as uh, disease vectors in some cases. Um, and then agriculture and forestry, both of which are huge in Pennsylvania. Um, they can cause billions of dollars, uh, cost billions of dollars in chemical and cultural control of non-native weeds, insects, and other diseases. They can directly contribute to crop loss. And even when crops aren't lost, they can they can damage crops, which can decrease the market marketability and uh, decrease already thin profit margins um, for, for farmers in, in the state. Um, and some plants also are, are toxic to, to livestock. 
So those are all great, uh, many, a long list, right? But what most folks want to know, well, what does this come down to in a number? You know, what, what, how big are these impacts actually? Um, uh, well, one of the most, if not the most widely cited study is this one done in 2005 uh, by Pimentel. Um, his study revealed that the economic damages associated with alien invasive species effects and their control amount to approximately 120 billion per year, just in the United States alone. They go on to say in the study that if they had been able to assign monetary values to species extinctions, losses in biodiversity, ecosystem services and aesthetics, um, those costs would undoubtedly be several times higher than that amount. Um, and one other quote I, I felt was, was, was very important to point out from the study is, uh, we have a long way to go before the resources devoted to the problem are in proportion to the risks. Uh, we hope that this environmental and economic assessment will advance the argument that investments made now to prevent future introductions will be returned many times over and the preservation of natural ecosystems, diminished losses to agriculture and forestry, and lessened threats to public health. So some very um, interesting comments there and, and fit facts and figures. So because of all that, um, oops, uh, because of all those potential impacts and, and the importance of invasive species, bringing this home to Pennsylvania, uh, Governor Wolf reissued an executive order in 2017 to, to help mitigate some of these invasive species impacts. Um, he reinvigorated the Invasive Species Council and increased uh, the membership of, of non-government organizations from 10 to 14. Um, that, that executive order uh, stated that the council shall provide a forum through which multiple state agencies and, and NGOs meet with the common purpose of identifying invasive species of concern that threaten the Commonwealth's natural and agricultural resources. Uh, specifically, uh, we were given three responsibilities. Uh, we're to, to develop and implement a statewide invasive species management plan. We're to provide guidance on prevention, control, and rapid response initiatives in the state. And uh, we're to facilitate coordination among federal, regional, state, and local efforts. Um, invasive species do not follow jurisdictional, political, geographic boundaries for the most part. Uh, so it's important for all uh, impacted uh, stakeholders to be to, to work together and coordinate their efforts. And that's one of the primary uh, purposes of the council. So who's on the council? Um, well, the executive order uh, designated seven uh, state agencies, all with various jurisdictional uh, uh, jurisdictional responsibilities for resp uh, invasive species, um, as well as I mentioned before, 14 non-government agencies, uh, organizations. Uh, these range from uh, uh, agricultural uh, industry, conservancies, uh, universities, and so on. You can read the full list there, but it's a, it's a fairly diverse group uh, of, of, of all uh, sectors of the state that are impacted by invasive species. All right, so with that sort of background in place, uh, I, what I wanna do now is, is just very quickly uh, go, go into some of the, the key projects that we're working on now, just going through the various committees that exist just on a very surface level um, to give you an idea of what, what we're working on, what we think are important um, and without going into too much detail, but certainly if any of these, these committees and, and their, um, their priorities uh, pique your interest, please please get in touch with me and I can I can expand that on that more. Um, but the first committee here is the in, uh, invasive species management plan. So I mentioned that was one of our mandates in the executive order. Um, so uh, we the council is is required to to update this plan on a regular five year cycle. And that plan is is sort of a top level statewide level um, a targeted audience to, to leaders, policymakers, and program managers. So you're not going to find in this plan, for example, best management practices for dealing with Japanese stillgrass. It's not that level. It's it's higher level. Um, what sort of programs, uh, policies need to be in place to, to adequately protect Pennsylvania. Um, so we're working on that now. 
and we hope to have that updated version here later in this year. Um, the committee that's working on now, that now has representatives from Penn State, from Temple University, uh, Department of Ag, uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Pennsylvania Sea Grant, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, and the US Forest Service. Um, this is this this work group, this committee, second committee has has a very similar name, but it's it's different in function. Um, this is a new group we're trying to form uh, in, uh, in uh, this year. the The intention is to sort of increase the capacity of the council. Um, we we want to bring in outside, you know, uh, expertise and experience from outside the current council membership, uh, particularly folks that are. Uh, "Quote unquote," those boots on the ground that are that are seeing invasive species effects every day that are working with them. Uh, so we want to form this work group to sort of help um, do more, to help the council do more, and to address some of the goals that are outlined in that invasive species management plan that I just described. So certainly here, um, anyone on the call today that might be interested in. in taking part in that group, uh, participating in that group, certainly get in touch with me. We're, we're, we're trying to recruit folks for that now. Um, a third committee is uh, what we're calling an invasive species list listing committee. Um, and the purpose of this group, uh, we've taken three um, recommendations out of the existing invasive plan. Uh, and those you can read here. Um, we want to utilize risk assessments and conduct new evaluations in order to prioritize invasive species in the state. Uh, we also want to establish and prioritize a list of species that are not currently present but should be prevented from entry. Uh, and we want a list of invasive species that do occur in Pennsylvania, uh, but what that we wish to prevent further expansion throughout the state. Uh, and third, we want to list uh, those species on our website communicate them to lawmakers, program managers, public, et cetera. This, these kind of lists and this kind of prioritization, I think really establishes the foundation of any invasive species management in the state. Uh, and so we hope to, the council hopes to really be the, the source of these lists, uh, the, the authority to, that defines what these those priorities are. Um, so that committee has been working for some time now. Um, and, and developing those assessments is not a, a trivial matter. Um, there are a number of, you know, as I went through in the beginning, there are a lot of potential impacts that invasive species have and, and trying to evaluate what any individual species, uh, uh, those impacts may be. Uh, it, it, takes, it takes a fairly detailed assessment process. Um, so we reviewed, reviewed a number of, of different assessments that exist. Um, out there, uh, and, and we basically adopted a, a 25 question assessment procedure for specific for invasive plants, um, and also a, a separate 16 question assessment procedure for, for everything else, for all non-plant invasive species. Um, another thing we've accomplished uh, recently this year is we provided a, a ranked list of 150 invasive plant species uh, we think are particularly important uh, in Pennsylvania, as well as a, a, a sort of a top 25 list. Uh, we recommended to the Controlled Plant Noxious Weed Committee. Uh, th that committee is responsible for adding new plants to the, to the state noxious weed regulatory list. Um, so we, we just provided it as a recommendation. Um, so, and next up, we hope to continue to create prioritized lists, but for other species, uh, for other taxonomic groups besides plants, um, both uh, lists, lists for both currently established and also for early detection rapid response uh, species, along with uh, full assessments for those hopefully uh, and scores, assessment scores. Um, for those that are curious about that top 25 list we provided to, the, to that committee, um, I, we don't have time, obviously, to go through it all here, but I just wanted to throw it up on the screen. Uh, I'm happy to share this with anyone that's interested. Um, but but here, here are those top 25 species groups um, that, that we recommended next be added to the state noxious weed list. All right, um, another committee um, is the Aquatic Invasive Species Rapid Response Plan Committee, um, perhaps particularly pertinent for this group here today or relevant. 
Um, there is a rapid response plan for aquatic invasive species in Pennsylvania. And just as with the, 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 the general invasive species management plan, um, this one is, is lo looks to get updated regularly. Um, uh, notably, this, this group is led by Sarah Stallman, who who's, uh, works for Pennsylvania Sea Grant. She, she's been great at leading that group. Um, in, uh, in addition to updating that plan, um, that group wants to develop best management practices for particular aquatic invasive species and, and place those on the Invasive Species Council website as a reference for organizations and agencies. Um, once, those, once the plan has been updated, BMPs have been established. Uh, this group would like to work on conducting mock exercises to test, to test those, the plan and the BMPs. Um, some recent accomplishments that this group has done um, is we added an, an AIS option to the reporting, invasive species reporting hotline in the state. And we created a new number that's more memorable for that hotline, you, which you can see here on the screen, it's 833 invasive. So that for those that didn't know there is that, that hotline that exists in the state, currently has options for invasive insects, invasive plants and aquatic invasive species. Um, we also have a grants committee, uh, often one of the greatest limitations to, to managing, controlling invasive species is just a lack of funds. So we wanted to try and address that by at least creating a, an online resource for um, all, many of the uh, grant programs that exist in the state and on the federal level. So if you go to our website, that, that, that list is there along with some links. So we, we hope that that's a helpful resource. Um, it was mentioned in my introduction, um, we hope to create a weed-free commodity certification program. So there are many, um, many commodities that are shipped throughout the state uh, and, and imported into the state, such as uh, forage, mulch, gravel, fill. All these things have uh, tremendous potential to introduce and spread invasive species, particularly invasive plant seeds that may um, maybe growing where, where those products are are stored or harvested or or, or wherever. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to create some kind of certification program that would certify those products as being free from invasive species in the future. Um, that that, that uh, requires a bit of, of authority. Uh, we're hoping that the Department of Ag will, will be given some of that, the authority to, to operate a program like that. Uh, and that's, that's currently being worked on in a, in a revision or an update to the Plant and Pollinator Protection Act. All right, hopefully I still have uh, some time left because what I really wanna focus on today, what I think the biggest um, initiative uh, that the council is working on is called the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management or PRISM for short. Um, we think that the PRISM program is, is really the, the future um, of, of invasive species management for our state. Um, so what is it in particular? Um, I'll I try to do, explain this briefly. Um, well, obviously from the acronym, it's, it's regionally based. So trying to manage species on invasive species on a statewide scale is, is a very cumbersome task. Um, having just a few agencies or organizations trying to cover the whole footprint of the state uh, is, is difficult um, logistically, but also, you know, ha having a good handle on what's really happening at, at a local level can be extremely challenging. So the idea in, in a program like this is to break the state up into regions, have local leadership, ha have local priorities, and, and, and um, have that local leadership really take responsibility for invasive species management in that region, rather, again, rather than uh, sort of on a statewide scale. Um, the partnerships portion of this is, is important too, and that's um, number two here. It's, it's a collaborative and, and cooperative effort between all stakeholder groups. So not just the responsibility of, of a handful of agencies, but, but bringing together um, all stakeholder groups to work on this together. And then uh, 
um, what, what just as important as all these things mentioned is, is funding. In order for a program like this to work, uh, funding is needed to coordinate and guide and lead this kind of program. So um, just providing a little more detail on this by what's meant, uh, what's meant by regionally based, um, there's a few other states that have similar programs. Um, uh, I've just showed some maps here. This is how, like, for example, New York, Michigan, and Florida ha has broken up their state into these uh, regional areas that, again, are, are, are responsible for dealing with invasive species in their region. So uh, that's just to give you an idea of size and, and, and ways that, that uh, states are broken up. Who's in a prison? Well, as I mentioned already, it's, it's all stakeholder groups. But this, this is a, 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 a partner list that I took as an example from one of those prism regions in New York. This is the lower Hudson prism in New York. Uh, so you can see the, the diversity of groups that are all working together uh, from, from the Audubon Society, from conservancy groups to cooperative extension offices, um, state agencies, universities, the works. I mean, land trusts, everyone involved um, is working together. It's, it's really impressive and, and inspiring. All right, so maybe the next question is, what, what do prisms do? Well, the idea is that if, if you haven't, um, if it hasn't been clear already, is that they do they do everything. Um, we want them to survey, map, monitor, manage, and eradicate, uh, develop early detection, rapid response capacity, provide education and outreach, organize events and volunteers, uh, coordinate large and diverse partnerships. And if, if they're successful in doing that, you can read all the, these great outcomes um, that I've listed here. And basically they're, they're, the outcomes are mitigating all of those, those impacts that I, that I, that list of impacts that I uh, went through at the beginning of my presentation. So we, the potential here is, is, is tremendous. So that's, that's a lot of potential. That's a lot of possibility, but what's, you know, how effective are these type of programs actually? Um, well, again, I'm taking some uh, a concrete example from this from the Lower Hudson Prism in New York. Uh, I've pulled out just a just a sampling of um, the accomplishments from from their report that they released in 2018. You can see some of them that I've listed here, uh, underlined here. Um, they've they've spent over 15,000 hours in one year uh, working on invasive species with, with partners. They, they are actually able to detect several new species, invasive species in their region, which is incredibly important to prevent spread of those. Um, they held training sessions. They organized volunteers, uh, many hours of, of invasive species efforts, uh, supported and coordinated interns, um, 323 removal projects targeting 172 different invasive species, uh, treating over 2,000 acres. So, I think those are some pretty impressive numbers. Um, but don't just take that one, one example uh, as, as gospel. Each of those, those eight prisms in New York releases an annual report. Uh, I definitely encourage you to, to, to go to their websites, uh, browse through some of their reports and just see the different projects they're working on, the progress they're making, the success they're having. It, it truly is impressive. So that, you know, that's, that's sort of the elevator pitch, if you will, for a prison program. Uh, the council and myself think, think it's, a, it's really a successful program, something we'd like to see established in Pennsylvania. Um, so we've been working on that pretty hard uh, over the past couple of years. And you, know, you just take this in a stepwise process. Um, first step is we have to define the number of, of regions and boundaries in Pennsylvania. How do we wanna break Pennsylvania up in a way that makes sense? Uh, then step two, we want to define the operational procedures for those prisons. H how will they be administered and how will the program be implemented throughout the state? Uh, funding is going to be extremely important uh, for these, these prisons to, to operate successfully. Um, we're estimating um, a three to nine million dollar annual budget for, for the statewide program to operate. And then finally, when those three things are in place, uh, we need to identify that lead organization in each prism region to lead and guide those efforts to, to do all those coordinated uh, all the coordination 
So um, this is the recommendation of the council in terms of defining number of regions and boundaries in the state. Um, we deliberated on this for quite some time, but we, we, we settled upon using the Pennsylvania Association of Conservation District Regions. Um, reasons for that being conservation districts are already set up uh, as, as, as um, protectors of the environment. And they also work closely with, with landowners, uh, other agencies and uh, uh, units of government and, and other groups. So there's already this existing infrastructure it's already this group of people that are, are used to working together. Um, so we, we felt like just sort of piggybacking on that infrastructure and that those strengths would, would, would only help uh, the effectiveness of this prison program in, in Pennsylvania. Um, second step um, would be the actual operation administration. Uh, for the, uh, we have worked on that. I, I'd love to walk through this flowchart in detail, but. Uh, I'm sure I'm already running out of time, if not already out of time, um, but I can share this with anyone that's interested. Basically, the idea here is that the, the council, in, in coordination with the Department of Ag, would, would administer and oversee the program. Um, we, we've sort of defined members of each of those, those entities in that flowchart, what, what the purpose of each is, what their responsibilities are. Again, I'm, I'm happy to share that with folks that may be interested in some of that finer grain detail. Um, but ultimately where, where we are at this point is the, the prison program needs support of folks in Pennsylvania. Um, the council can recommend this all, all they want and, and agencies can support it. But at the end of the day, um, this, this program needs state funding. And, and that comes down to constituents, uh, groups uh, uh, make, making it known that they, they want a prison program in the state. Um, the council uh, is trying to, 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 to do some of that in, in whatever capacity it can. Um, and one of the things we've done is uh, another committee that exists on the council is legislation and policy committee. Um, and we worked this past year with the Center for Rural Pennsylvania to hold a legislative hearing um, to highlight the importance and the impacts of invasive species and to make the case for uh, why the state uh, why Pennsylvania needs a prison program. Um, you, we, had a, we had a great uh, speaker lineup. Uh, um, you can see that, that list here. Um, if, if you're interested, if you hadn't known about this uh, before, you can go to the Center for Rural Pennsylvania website. You can watch the video of that testimony you can also download uh, all the written testimony that was that was submitted and a summary of, of testimony, uh, a, a summary of the hearing. Um, last committee I wanna mention uh, is, is a PISC, the Council Communications Committee. Um, this this uh, uh, committee is working on, trying to work on an, on an op-ed campaign, again, just to try and promote and, and raise awareness about this prison program. Um, in the past, we've also created a, a, a fairly long and detailed, but very interesting story map about uh, all the invasive species work that is currently being done in the state, uh, ranging uh, from uh, efforts that state agencies uh, are making, as well as, as different organizations. You can find that on our website. Definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, we also have a newsletter. You can sign up for that on our website as well. Um, that's a quarterly newsletter where we, we try to bring you the latest um, work efforts and, and recommendations of the council, as well as other relevant uh, invasive species developments in the state. Uh, and of course, we're always working on website improvements. Okay, um, lastly, uh, I've been mentioning our webpage a lot. It's, it's really easy to find. Just If you just search for governor's invasive species, it's usually the first or second result that comes up. Um, It'll take you to that page that you see on the left here. Lots, lots of information on our, our committees and, and the prison program in particular. You can sign up for the newsletter. Uh, definitely would uh, hope that folks will check that out. And, and that is finally the end. I uh, hope I didn't go over time too much. Uh, here's my contact information. Very last thing I'll say is that uh, our council meetings are, are always open to the public. We, we encourage participation um, and, and, and attendance. 
anyone wants information on how they can attend the next meeting, which is on March 8th, uh, please shoot me an email. So, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And you know, I, I was thinking to myself here an analogy that, that, that an space, invasive species coordinator might uh, might relate with. And um, you know, there's these games on our phones for at their applications that are called castle defense games. And, and the premise behind this is that you know you're in this castle and you have enemies that come at you. Uh, continuously and you lay up defenses so that they don't reach the castle gates and uh, and every level the the invaders become uh, greater in number and more resilient and so this has a lot of um, relation to invasive species where you're you're constantly at guard trying to defend against uh, new introductions and um, sometimes they're they're even worse than the ones that came before them right that's a great analogy. Yeah, I like that. So um, no, I really appreciate it. I would I have several questions here, but I'll, I'll follow up uh, later. And I encourage anybody who has questions for Chris to drop them into our question and answer box. And we'll try to answer those as we go through uh, with our next presenter. And um, Amber, I'm going to turn this over to you to introduce um, a gentleman who needs no introduction, but deserves an introduction. And, uh, and so uh, over to you, Amber. Thanks, Tim. And thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. Um, there are a few questions for you in the Q&A. So if you can answer those before you jump off, that would be wonderful. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to introduce Tom Crane, even though he needs no introduction, we're still going to do him the justice of a wonderful introduction. Tom is the Deputy Director of the Great Lakes Commission. Tom joined the Great Lakes Commission in 1986 and has nearly 40 years of Great Lakes research management and policy experience. Tom has served as deputy director of the Great Lakes Commission since 2008. As deputy director, he is responsible for overseeing many of the administrative, operational, human resources, financial, and programmatic functions of the agency. Crane serves as the lead staff person for several district projects, sorry, several distinct projects in the Great Lakes Commission done in partnership with other agencies, including the management of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Regional Water Use Database. Before joining the commission, Crane's previous work included positions with the Great Lakes Basin Commission, NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, and several years of NGO experience in Virginia and Missouri, where Crane directed two citizen-based environmental groups. Crane holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resources and a Master of Science degree in Water Resource Management from the University of Michigan. So Tom, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about water use statistics and trends in the Great Lakes and Pennsylvania. Amber, thank you so much for the nice introduction. And, and I wanna thank you and Tim for inviting me. And I took a peek at the participants list and I was delighted to see so many friends and colleagues from Pennsylvania, but I was equally delighted to see so many familiar names from people from other states. So this is really great. This has been a really important meeting, and I think you could have held a whole afternoon session on any of these topics. So I'm going to share my screen here. If it works, it worked uh, during... And go to the slideshow. Let's see. There we go. There we go. And I'm going to go off camera here and I will come back on camera if there are questions. So, um, again, thanks for having me. And I've got about a dozen and a half slides, and I'm going to try to go through them pretty quickly to get to the part of this presentation that I think people will be most interested in. And water use is one of those topics that's kind of hard to prepare for because so many people have so many different things that they're interested in. So I have tried to anticipate what I think this audience will be most interested in, but I can certainly follow up with any of you uh, at the end of the talk. Um, 
if there are some things that I didn't cover or can't answer. And there, there are five things that I want to do real quickly today. One is to provide a background on the history of the water use data collection and reporting program and briefly cover the requirements to collect and report water use data under the Water Resources Compact and Agreement, uh, provide background on the regional water use database itself, what data is collected and reported, and a few important definitions, uh, provide a summary of water use in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin, along with some facts and trends, provide a summary of water use in Pennsylvania, along with some facts and trends. And then I'll close with a brief summary of areas of progress and opportunities for improvement in the collection and reporting of water use data. So uh, just to give you a brief history, so many of you may not be aware, the Regional Water Use Database has been around for a long time, close to 35 years. And it was first established under the um, Great Lakes Compact, which was a non-binding water management agreement that was entered into by the governors and premiers back in 1985. And at the conclusion of the signing of that agreement, the governors and premiers formed a water resources management committee that was responsible for uh, developing the implementation protocols for the compact. I actually had the opportunity to provide staff support to that uh, water resources committee. And one of the recommendations that came out of that report was to establish a regional water use database. So we did that. Um, it became operational in 1988 and we reported first on water use data in 1987. Currently, we, the Great Lakes Commission continues to serve as the database repository under a memorandum of understanding with Great Lakes governors and premiers, which I think all of you know are responsible for implementing the compact and the um, sustainable water resources agreement. And of course, the compact was entered into by the states and the agreement entered into by both the states and the provinces. The database supports the Water Resources Compact and Regional Water Use Agreement under Article 4 of the Compact and Article 301 of the Agreement. We have reports for years 1987 through 93. There was a four-year program where we didn't collect and report on data because of lack of funding, but we have continuous data from 1998 to 2014, and I should have updated that. We actually, our most current report is through 2020. Uh, and we have updated water use data protocols that define the requirements of the state and provinces to provide data which have been fully implemented since 2012. This I'm not gonna go through too much. The, you can look these up in the compact in the agreement, but they call for a water resources inventory uh, to have compatible water use information. One thing that is important is there is a threshold limit for reporting, which is 100,000 gallons per day average over a 30 day period or 379,000 liters per day. And the report um, provides aggregate information um, only. So we don't have the ability to provide uh, information on a sub watershed level, which has often been a point of discussion when we talk about regional data. Database contents. So we measure withdrawals, consumptive use, diversions in and out of the basin and intra-basin diversions. There are 10 water use sectors that we report on, six watersheds, and of course, all 10 jurisdictions provide data to the water use database. Real quickly on definitions, and today I'm just gonna be talking about withdrawals and consumptive uses. Um, diversions would probably be a separate presentation. Uh, but withdrawals, when we talk about withdrawals, it's the taking of water from surface water or groundwater. Um, 
consumptive use is that portion of water withdrawn or withheld from the basin that is lost or otherwise not returned to the basin. And diversion is the transfer of water out of the basin. So here we are with the a pie chart showing 2020 water withdrawals, 379, 37.9 billion gallons per day. This is for all of the categories excluding in-stream hydroelectric. If we included in-stream hydroelectric, we would, um, this pie chart would look very different because in-stream hydroelectric represents more than 93% of all of the withdrawals. But the decision was made years ago that it's most uh, important to focus on the other water use category. So we back that one out. And this is what the pie chart looks like by jurisdiction. And I think interesting for this audience is Pennsylvania has the smallest annual water use and is not represented on the pie chart, only 30 million gallons per day. This shows uh, a similar breakdown of the data um, over a uh, five-year period. And it's a bar chart that shows you a little bit of the trend in water use. And you'll see that water use in most jurisdictions is trending slightly downward. We have a few jurisdictions where the water use is mostly flat. And again, Pennsylvania is just barely visible on this bar chart. Um, public water supply, and I broke down a few um, uh, individual categories in order to just allow you to see what some of the trends that are occurring in the region. Public water supply just, you know, is basically what the name means is water distributed to the public through a physically connected system of treatment, storage, and distribution facilities serving a group of largely residential customers. Uh, and public water suppliers may also serve industrial, commercial, and other institutional operators in some instances. And you'll see that this trend is slightly downward over the last six years. Self-supply industrial, this, uh, oh, and I should have said that uh, self-supply uh, or um, public water supply is the second largest water use category. Self-supply industrial is the third largest category. And um, self-supply industrial, and again, just as the name needs and it name suggests includes water use in the manufacture of metals, chemicals, paper, food and beverage and other products as well as mining water use. Withdrawal and consumptive uses for industrial and mining purposes uh, are not recorded here. And um, self-supply industrial is again, trending slightly downward as you can see on this chart. And then self-supply irrigation, and irrigation is, is defined by the compact and the agreement as water artificially applied on lands to assist in the growing of crops and pastures or in the maintenance of recreational lands, such as parks and golf courses. This is not currently a large water user, as you can see, it's only about 500 MGD. But I included it here, one, because it is relevant to Pennsylvania's water use, and two, because it's one of those categories that is variable and may be trending upward slightly due to climate change and changes in regional precipitation patterns. So in other words, some areas, uh, agricultural areas that historically have not had to irrigate are now finding themselves having to irrigate. Uh, this is the consumptive use chart. Um, and consumptive use, again, seems to be trending downward. Uh, 
But the expectation is for consumptive use to occasionally see annual increases corresponding with dry and hot years. So you'll see that there was a slight uptick in 2020. 2020 was a dry, hot year for most of the basin. Um, and in 2020, consumptive use was about 5.3% of withdrawals. So, um, and, and I'm mentioning that just because when we get to Pennsylvania, you'll see there's a little bit of a difference there. So here's Pennsylvania. Um, and Pennsylvania has uh, a portion a portion of Pennsylvania's basin is in Lake Erie, the main portion, and a smaller portion is in the Lake Ontario basin. So about 237,000 people uh, live in the Lake Erie basin and about 2,500 people live in Pennsylvania's portion of the Lake Ontario basin. Um, the total withdrawal amount from the basin in 2020 for Pennsylvania was 30 million gallons per day. This was a 21% reduction from 2019. Um, and um, the total or most of the uh, withdrawal amount was for 91%, I think, was for public water supply. So just to give you, if you look at this chart, you'll see some changes over the last five years. And just to give you a sense of what those changes are, um, no water use occurred for self-supply industrial, in the self-supply industrial sector for the 2020 report. Uh, and then, and 4MGD was reported in 2019. One, and this was because one large facility went out of business and another facility that normally reported above the 100,000 uh, MGD threshold level reported under that in 2020 and was not reported. So that's primarily it. You'll see that the other sectors that are there include um, self-supply livestock and a little bit in the self-supply irrigation. And then a similar breakdown in consumptive use. Um, total consumptive use in 2020 in Pennsylvania was 3.3 million gallons per day. Public water supply sector made up the majority of this 83% of the total consumptive use. And Pennsylvania's consumptive use is about 11% of withdrawals. Um, which is about double the consumptive use for the entire basin. Now, I think to explain that, one is Pennsylvania's water use is small, and two, the categories that Pennsylvania reports on are those categories where we normally see a higher consumptive use rate. So in other words, some of the power generation um, categories are ones where we would not expect to see consumptive use. And so it's, it's in, on a percentage basis, it's higher, but again, because of Pennsylvania's small water use, um, it's not um, any, it's not to be unexpected. And the consumptive use for irrigation increased by 42% between 2019 and 2020. This was due to the hot, dry spring and summer in 2020. So I'm gonna wrap up here uh, with some observations and maybe we'll have time for some questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So here are some general observations. One is there has been a gradual decline in water withdrawals over the past decade. There has been a gradual decline in consumptive use, but single year increases are expected due primarily to changes in climate and precipitation. Self-supply irrigation, self-supply livestock water uses are more variable and may trend gradually upward due to changing climate and precipitation. Public water supply changes will be influenced locally by changes in population and water quality issues and concerns. 
So that's why the state and provincial water managers need to pay attention to the public water supply sector because uh, as populations change and as demand for water in local areas changes, there could be areas that might uh, become stressed over time. Uh, just to give you, uh, you, you know, and this is, I think this is a really good progress report for the region. Uh, since 2012, uh, data quality has improved. This was, 2012 was the first year of implementing the uh, new water use collection and reporting protocols. We have improved compliance in water use data collection and reporting across all jurisdictions. Now for some, it's not 100%. And again, I think for Pennsylvania, two of the categories in their small water users overall are the uh, irrigation and livestock sectors. The compliance and reporting in those sectors tends to be a little bit lower, but for most of the main water use sectors, compliance is really high at or near 100%. We have improved documentation of data sources. So in other words, we have spent a lot of time and effort on metadata uh, over the last 10 years. So in other words, understanding the data behind the data. And there's been a much higher commitment and investment by the states and provinces in their water use data collection and reporting programs. And really one of the reasons why the compact and the agreement became necessary was because the non-binding agreement under the Great Lakes Charter, the states and provinces, there was no um, legislative authority behind those programs. And so we had trouble sustaining them at a level necessary for the region. Uh, ongoing needs and opportunities for improvement. Uh, one of the things that the science strategy team and the governors and premiers are looking at along with the water managers is to improve consumptive use reporting. It's an area where we need to see more direct measurement, more refined estimation protocols and greater consistency in the use of coefficients. More research to better explain unexpected, unusual changes in data from one year to the next. So the metadata has helped with that, but we're still trying to understand annual changes a bit better. Uh, and a continued commitment to improve data collection and reporting, especially for specific categories, a self-supply irrigation, self-supply livestock. And the U.S. Geological Survey has played a really important role in this because they have invested a lot of money to do sector-based research. So they've looked at the power uh, industry, they uh, looked at the irrigation industry and are gonna be looking at, I, I believe, some other sectors in the future. And then re-examining the benefits of reporting data on a sub-watershed scale. Now, the regional database right now is not set up for that. So any sub-watershed analysis has to occur between uh, at the state provincial level. And so if the region wants the regional database to be a more valuable tool, that's something that we could uh, discuss in the future. There's my contact information and the uh, web address on the bottom is where you can find the water use database reports if you're interested in them. And I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna go back on camera and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Tom. And, uh, you know, those numbers kind of encapsulate a, a trend in Pennsylvania um, as of last year. You know, it, it takes an entire year for us to catalog uh, and, and report our water use. So the last uh, year that we, we currently have reported is uh, for 2020. 
And uh, as you mentioned, there was a 20% decrease in overall water use in the Pennsylvania Great Lakes Basin. Um, and that was accounted for by two major areas. As you mentioned, um, for those on the call who are familiar with the area, um, Erie Coke, which was a manufacturing facility, um, was a large user of, of, of directly supplied water um, from the lake. And uh, they did go out of business in, in 2019. The other portion of that is a success story though. And uh, it's, it's one that hasn't been, I, I think, widely known so far, but, but I, I, I would like it to be, is that um, there was a 13% decrease in public water supplies. And, and so it went from 31.4 million gallons per day in 2019 to 27.5 million gallons per day in 2020. Now, most of that is due because we have one major utility that supplies water to uh, the area, and that's Erie Water Works, which covers uh, several municipalities. And what we noticed there when we started digging into the data when we were reporting it to the Great Lakes Commission was that there was a 3.2 million gallon per day reduction in non-revenue water loss. And for those who are not familiar with that term, that's the water that's, that's, that's lost throughout the system due to um, leaks or inefficiencies, et cetera, that you never get back. Um, and, and, and what that shows there is a couple of things. Is that's a lot, first of all, that's a lot of water to um, account for in one year. Um, but also that there's two things that played in that. One, we had a, a, a pretty um, warm winter last year, which led to fewer line breaks inside of the system, um, which also leads to lower operating costs, but also the dedication of the Erie Waterworks um, to uh, put into place asset management plans uh, and replace their infrastructure at a rate where they knew that there were problems and that leads to uh, less instances of breakage and non-revenue water loss. So really the proactive planning by the community and Erie Waterworks to fix their underground infrastructure has led to overall better efficiency um, in our water use here in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I, I just want to call attention to another thing, Tom, I think you're the only uh, person that I know of, uh, you know, I serve as a, a Great Lakes Commissioner from Pennsylvania and um, also serve on the board of directors. And, and to my knowledge, there has never been a resolution passed by all eight Great Lakes states and both provinces uh, joining in, congratulating an individual for their service to the commission before. And I'll just say in October of last year, um, there was a full resolution that is in uh, an interstate compact agency's records, acknowledging your contributions over the last 35 years. And I. I but really, um, you know, appreciate your service there. Um, also, I don't know anybody else who has a library named after them, which you do. So I do. I do have a library named <laughs> after me. And that, my, my comment that I wanted to make at the start was Lauren and Duane are genuine experts. And so I don't know if anyone would call me an expert on water use, but I've hung around long enough where people probably think I'm an expert. <laughs> you're an established authority <laughs> but it but you know it's like I you know one of my first when I walked in the door at the commission one of my first assignments was to provide staff support to that water resources management committee that was working on implementing the Great Lakes Charter so I was really in on this pretty much at the ground level and we, have, we certainly have made a lot of progress in, in the last uh, 35 years and, and tons of progress in the last decade. And, and I appreciate you making your comment at the end because I failed to mention that we're seeing downward trends also because of water conservation measures that the states and provinces are implementing. And then, like you said, investment in the public water supply sector and, and um, to really begin to eliminate those losses through, through uh, leaky pipes and that sort of thing. And I think that's going to serve the region well because, you know, we heard at one of our recent 
commission meetings that when we see all of the challenges that many other regions in this country face with regard to impacts from climate change, we may become a climate haven. And so people may gradually begin to come back to the region because we have, uh, we have plenty of fresh water and some of the climate challenges that we face, and they're still great for people that are working on, on those issues, but we're not experiencing the, the flooding, the wildfires, the uh, earthquakes, the uh, hurricanes, um, all of those things that are occurring in other parts of the country. And so I do think that Water managers are challenged in thinking about not only how do we serve our communities right now, but how do we serve them 15 to 20 years in the future? Yeah, I agree. And I had mentioned at the top of uh, top of the meeting today that Pennsylvania is chairing um, the, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Water Resources uh, Compact Council and Regional Body this year. And, and part of the work plan that's in place is, is for our science committees to do the overall cumulative impact assessment as to what our water use is looking like over the last five years, the trend, trends that are going on with that, and what the overall impact of the entire resource is. Part of that um, study will also include looking at these smaller areas and what impacts from climate as well as potentially migration might do um, to the demands there. But Tom, thank you so much. We're, we're at the end of the hour here. Um, there was one question, and if you can answer it quickly, that'd be excellent. Um, we obviously have shale natural gas production here in, in Pennsylvania. Um, we don't have water uses for that currently inside of our Great Lakes Basin. But uh, what, what sector would that slot into um, uh, when you're talking about natural resource extraction, the use of water through fracturing, et cetera? So for those states that are reporting on those uses, that would go under the self-supply industrial uh, category. So like for instance, mining, those states that have mining um, and where there's water extraction for uh, mining practices and that sort of thing would go into the self-supply industrial category. Okay, excellent. All right, well, thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate your time here with us. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Amber to wrap us up for the afternoon. Thank you, Tim. And thank you again, Tom, and all of our presenters who were able to join us today. Thank you to all of our attendees who sat uh, with us for the last three hours and enjoyed these incredible presentations. Um, I'm going to send in the chat a Google form for you to fill out, whether you're a presenter or a um, attendee. And I hope that you will take just a couple minutes to give us your feedback on these LEAF meetings as we continue to think about them into the future. And um, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but we will be tentatively hosting the next LEAF meeting in April. So I'll turn it back to Tim for adjournment and any comments from attendees. All right, thank you so much. And uh... For this January meeting of the forum, I, I consider it uh, adjourned. Thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in April.